Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar on paediatrics subspecialty training applications in interview with a live Q&A. So we're just going to start with a round of introductions with all the presenters here, and then we'll go on to the presentation. So please um, do put any questions you have um, in the question box. There should be an icon for you to type those in and you can uh, start as asking those straight away. Or towards the end. So my name is Eloise. I'm the careers and training coordinator at the college. And I'm just going to um, ask Kay to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Kay Tyman. I'm Assistant Officer for Recruitment with Remit for Subspeciality Training and a Nephrologist in Leeds. And welcome everybody. And we also have a trainee here today, so I'll just introduce Monica. Hi everyone, my name is Monica. I'm a Paediatric SD8 and Community Child Health Grid trainee in West Yorkshire. And I'm looking forward to sharing with you my experience of applying for subspecialty training and, and hopefully give you some useful practical tips on how to make your application the best it can be, how to show the panel that you're enthusiastic and suited for your subspecialty. Thank you. So I'm just going to share the presentation. OK, so the agenda for this afternoon, I'm just going to talk about the changes for this recruitment round. And then we'll go through the timeline, the recruitment process from applying um, through to the offers process at the end. Then we'll go through the assessment areas, the shortlisting scoring, and we'll have some tips on a successful application and also for a virtual interview. And we're finished with a question and answer section. So new for this round, so the shortlisting section. So this is one of the assessment areas. So the domains are the same as previous years. There's seven domains and we'll be going through those a bit later, but the scoring has changed slightly. The shortlisting scores were no longer carried through to the final overall score. So this will now be based, based on the interview score alone, whereas the shortlisting scores will uh, get you to interview and will be used in the situation of an interview score tie break. So the interviews, the same as last year, they'll be virtual again. We're going to be using the software practique. Because it's a virtual interview, there's no presentations to prepare. It's just a question based interview and all the panels are single panel. Whereas previously, if you uh, apply to a larger subspecialty like neonates, you would have had a split panel. So you would have gone into two virtual rooms. So on the screen, you can see all the subspecialties that you can apply to. Child mental health is also a subspecialty we recruit to, but they don't have any available posts this year. So uh, not all the subspecialties recruit each year. It just depends if they've got any posts available in the deaneries. So the timeline, this is available on the website. So at the moment, the programmes are available to view online. So if you go to our subspecialty page, <clears throat> there are programmes in the download section at the bottom of that page. And in there is a SharePoint link, so a link uh, where you can go and view all the job descriptions. So the application window opens next Wednesday and the applications are made through Oriel. We'll be going on to that. Um, you do need to remember the deadline for the confirmation of eligibility forms. So if you haven't sent that to your deanery yet, um, you might want to do that. because the deadline to get those to the deanery is the 8th of November. And uh, the application window closes there 12 noon, Wednesday, the 17th of November. And that's quite, it's a strict deadline. <clears throat> 
And then after following the shortlisting process, the invites to interview and shortlisting outcomes will be sent out via Oriel. And the interview period are the last two weeks of January and the start of February. So the timeline's been moved slightly back this year in line with the new proposals for shape of training to give trainees a bit more time to think about which subspecialties they would like to apply for. And you can um, order your preferences, your preference of offers and posts right up until the end of the interview period. And offers will be made uh, from Wednesday, the 9th of February, and you've got 48 hours to accept or decline the offers. Again, we we'll go through that in more detail. Uh, and following that, we have a clearing round. So onto the recruitment round. Before you apply, um, you need to fill out the confirmation of eligibility form. Now, I did say that the, the deadline to get those to the deanery is 8th of November. So you can fill out you know, details like your name and which subspecialty you, you want to apply to, but do send those uh, to your head of school and the contact details are on our website in the download section on who you need to send that to in your deanery. And then you need to send the completed form back to us their uh, ntn.grid email address and upload it as well to your oral application. So as I said, um, the applications are made through Oriel and uh, that's the web address there. We do also have it in our applicant guide. If you haven't had a look at that yet, I definitely recommend to um, download that and have a read through because all the information you need is in the applicant guide on the website. So this is what it looks like and you just uh, need to log in there as you see in the centre of the screen and uh, register for an account first. <clears throat> so yes, as I said, first thing, create an account. If you've um, if you uh, set up an account last year, you should be fine. But if you set up an account uh, previously, you'll need to create a new account as they've up updated the system last year. So all uh, accounts before that have been uh, deleted. Please also ensure the email address is current and the same one you use for your ePortfolio. Uh, we just wanted to talk about plagiarism. So any work you submitted or referenced, it must be the applicant's own. So we do um, treat plagiarism very seriously. So if any, if there is any anything that comes to light, then we will contact the heads of school and further action will be taken. So please keep that in mind. Um, the application also asks for three references. Um, so this is it just in case the employing deanery requires them for pre-employment checks. Uh, do save your application as you go. So Oriel does time out after one hour of no action. So um, alternatively, you can do your application outside of Oriel and paste it in when it's finished. Uh, there is a word count for each section and that will um, be actually, it will tell you how many words for each question uh, you can give. So do stick to that and um, you can, as again said, uh, you can check the word count if you do it outside of Oriel as you go. So think about your answers. Uh, really carefully uh, because there is that word count. Uh, bullet points do not show up in Oriel unless you copy and paste it into uh, notebook first and then paste it from there. So to upload your confirmation of eligibility form is, is two ways. So you can either upload it to your resources bank in Oriel first and then uh, when you come to the page on the application form, you can just upload it from there or uh, you can also just upload it from your computer. So um, either way there. Uh, when you're ready to submit your application, you need to make sure that every page is completed. And a green tick will display on the progress bar on the top of the page. So if you think you've finished the application, do just check you've got those green ticks. And if you haven't got that, you need to go through from the beginning of the application and click next as you go along. So next, 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 and a green tick should appear. And then once you've got all those green ticks, you can then it will allow you to submit your application. 
So please do allow at least 48 hours before the closing date, just in case there's any technical issues that come up, because we do not accept late applications under any circumstances. So uh, after the application window is shortlisting, so shortlisting is uh, four consultants from the subspecialty you're applying for, usually includes the CSAT chair. The largest subspecialties, they split the applications between um, the application questions between two panels. So three assessors mark maybe questions one to four and uh, three assessors might mark uh, five to seven of the questions. So but those assessors would mark all the questions, the questions for all the applicants. So the personal details and quality monitoring data are removed from the application forms before we um, give the, the answers and questions to the shortlisters. So they're scoring them anonymously. So following that, the applicants are then ranked according to the shortlisting scores and then a cutoff score is decided from the shortlisters. Um, for the invites to be an interview to be set. So that's based on the overall possible appointments and the timescales for interviews. So the outcomes and the, in the invites to interviews. So we will notify, notify applicants via oral week commencing Monday 13th of December. So successful applicants above that cutoff score will be emailed an invite. And the unsuccessful candidates will also find out the shortlisting outcome at the same time. So in that invitation, there will be the interview dates and instructions on how candidates can choose and book their interview times in Oriel. That is first come first serve basis. Uh, also, the length of the interview and the structure All the details will be in that email. So you can view your shortlisting score once it's been once that process has been completed, it's been input into the system and you can see that how you can find it. So in your oral account, there'll be a progress tracker and you actually do need to click on where it says shortlist and you'll, you'll see the score will then appear below. In that red ring. So we do send back out uh, shortlisting feedback, also interview feedback. So all applicants, whether shortlisted or not, will receive feedback. They'll receive the breakdown of the scores, their overall score and any comments from the panel. And that will be sent out week commencing Monday 2nd of December. So the interview outcomes, so candidates must achieve a minimum of 60% from their interview to be found uh, to be deemed appointable, but it is possible for some candidates who have got 60% not to be appointed if there are serious concerns like patient safety. Um, but these candidates, as with all candidates, would be discussed in the wash up at the end of the interview day and the lay advisor and the subspecialty recruitment team will be present along with the interviewers there for that discussion. So they'll review the interview score sheets and make a decision on whether the candidate should be found appointable. And um, all the interviewed candidates will be contacted by the college if they to be told if they've been successful or not from Wednesday the 9th of February. And then the office process for start. So this happens once all the interviews are complete. So applicants will be given a ranking and an offer will be released based on your placing of in the ranking and the preferences. So if you have uh, just one preference, uh, obviously you would uh, more likely be given that offer if you rank first or perhaps second but um, if you preference everywhere you've got a higher chance of being given an offer but it does depend on where you rank as well. So initial offers sent out Wednesday the 9th of February and you have 48 hours to decide what you want to do with the offer. So there's four options except 
it's set with upgrades, hold or decline. And uh, so if you want to accept, you know, if you've been given your first choice, you know, just choose that option. If it's um, for accept with upgrades, it's uh, if you if you receive an offer that's not your first choice and you'd like to accept the post but would prefer a post higher up your preference list, you should choose this option. So there is still a chance of being uh, getting one of your higher ranked preferences should an applicant above you in the rankings decline it during the first relief release of offers. So if this does occur, you'll be automatically upgraded if there are any additional iterations of offers released up into the upgrade deadline. So you would hold the offer. If you uh, interviewed for more than one subspecialty and would like to see additional offers before deciding uh, which to go for. And you will have the option of um, holding that offer. So uh, you can hold up to the holding deadline. Um, and at that point, it would then be released back to the vacancy. So you do need to make, make sure you make a decision by that whole deadline on whether you will accept it or decline it. And then it can be offered to another appointable candidate. So the um, your involvement in the office process uh, for that subspecialty will also end at that point and you won't be made any additional offers in that subspecialty. And if you choose to decline the offer, um, for whatever reason you have um that does also end your involvement in the offers process and you won't be able to receive any more offers from that subspecialty that doesn't stop you on applying again in future years though so i am now going to hand over to kay who will go through the assessment areas so like i said do keep adding your questions into the comments box if you have any thank you kay Thank you, Thank Eloise. You. So um, I'm going to spend time just really going over the shortlisting areas, um, but just to look at overall assessment areas for shortlisting and interview. So at shortlisting, we'll be assessing your clinical experience, um, your experience to date and quality improvement and audit through training, looking at opportunities you've had for management experience and how these give you transferable skills to the subspeciality that you're applying for, research achievements, publications, presentations and posters, education involvement in teaching, and finally, an overall statement to support your application. Um, I'm going to be handing over to Monica, um, one of our trainees, to talk about interview preparation, but at interview there will be four sections. So a section um, looking at how you deal with clinical situations and reasoning, um, an opportunity for you to discuss your academic understanding and what you've read about a subject, um, exploring multi multidisciplinary team working and learning skills, and also an expected question about your motivation um, and how you can draw in from your past achievements and strengths and what you will bring to that subspeciality. Next slide, please. So just going through the shortlisting scoring, just to say that all this information is available on the college website um, with a breakdown of the scoring for each section. So in clinical experience, we, are, we ask you to summarise the clinical experience you've had to date, including knowledge and skills that um, make you suitable for applying for this subspeciality. So obviously, if you present, if you don't put anything in this box, you will get a zero. Um, and you can see that um, we give um, more marks for answers that are specific um, and draw on its significant, significant examples through your training to date that are relevant to the subspeciality where you've managed to clearly develop, clearly explain your developmental needs and transferable skills. So the first section is scored zero to six. Next slide, Eloise. Um, the second question is looking at your involvement in quality improvement and audit throughout training to date. Um, and this is scored out of four. Um, and we're looking for detailed answers in this section. So we're interested in knowing, is this a, um, a QI or audit project that you have designed and led? 
even if you've designed and led it, we would expect that that would be with the input and support of a senior trainee or consultant. Um, and we're wanting you to really clearly describe um, the audit, your findings and how it has led to change in local practice and guidelines. And then also we're interested here, has this had a wider impact across the region or at a national level? So we're looking at sort of detailed discussion of audit and quality improvement projects. Next slide, please. Um, similarly, with leadership management experience, um, if you've um, worked at a sort of local level on remote organisation of a department, you can give a, a clear description of this and the role that you've played, then you would be allocated one mark. Um, if it's a, a more involved role at um, a sort of within your local organisation or at an undergraduate level, you will be awarded more marks. But we don't want to know that you, you were appointed to this role. We want to actually see what you are delivering and what personally you've been you've brought to the role to be allocated the marks. So for example, if you say, I've been appointed the regional lead for X, Y and Z, but you don't actually say what you do and what you contributed and what the role involves, you're not going to get the marks for that section. Next slide, please, Eloise. So research achievements. Um, so um, obviously no research, zero marks. A limited um, description of research and undergraduate or postgraduate level, one mark. If you're able to describe an undergraduate or postgraduate research project that you've played a part in, that is of a high standard, then you will get more marks. And obviously, the bigger the role that you've had, the more marks will be allocated. Um, and if you've presented this um, locally, then hopefully you'll have a good description. You've presented it locally, you'll get three marks. If it's something that you've had an opportunity to publish or present at a national level, Four marks, but that's only provided that you also include a good description of the work that's been undertaken. Next slide, Eloise. So publications, presentations and posters. Um, last year and this year, we won't um, put a bar on the maximum number of marks awarded if you leave your name on the publication, but we would encourage you not to include your name on any sort of publications um, or author list for posters. Um, but you are able to state on Oriel whether you are um, submitting this evidence as being a sort of a, a co-author or um, a presenter or a, a first author. And next slide, please. And education. So in this section, um, it's out of potential maximum mark of four marks. There's up to three marks for um, teaching involvement in your description of that, um, and an extra mark that may be awarded if you've completed a generic instructor course, teach the teachers or equivalent, or you've under undertaken a diploma in postgraduate medical education. And next slide, Eloise. And then finally, an overall statement to support your application. And we don't um, encourage repetition in the different sections of your application for shortlisting, but this is a section where there will be repetition because you'll be wanting to, to draw everything together to say, you know, why you are the best candidate um, and why you are suitable for applying for a post in your chosen subspeciality. So you're drawing really on all your past experiences and also what you personally could bring to that subspeciality. And that's out of a maximum of four marks. We've also included a glossary with the shortlisting application, which will sort of give you a little bit more information on how we would define, for example, a national meeting or an international meeting and various terms that are used um, in the shortlisting um, marking criteria. Thank you. And I think at this stage, I'm handing over to Monica. Thank you, Monica. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Taiman. Um, do allow me to start by saying that applying for some specialty training was one of the best training related decisions I've ever made. 
Um, that's obviously alongside choosing to train in pediatrics in Yorkshire and choosing community child health. Um, it really allowed me to tailor my training according to my interests, shape my own path in a way, um, whilst doing um, working in an area of pediatrics that I really love. Um, and I was one of few fortunate trainees um, placed in a community pediatrics job in level one, having had no prior knowledge of this. Uh, and therefore had the chance to experience the world directly. However, you don't need to have done a placement in your subspecialty to be successful at application and interview. But what I think you need to be very clear about is why do you want to train in this area of pediatrics? And also, what will you add to the field? How will your contribution enhance the subspecialty? Um, and when I went through this thinking process before applying, I really consider three points. First of all, do I like the job? Do I like what consultants are doing um, as part of their job plan, the setting where I'm likely to be uh, working in, the road I'm likely to cover uh, and so on? Um, then I ask myself, do I like the people I'm going to be working with? And this is including the children and families we look after uh, and the team working in, in my subspecialty. Um, and I would encourage you to get to know some of the people working in your area, uh, speak with consultants and current grid trainees, learn about what they do, what interests them, and um, see if your interests fit with, um, with the big picture. Um, the third um, important point I ask myself is, do I find the medicine interesting? Um, for example, do you suddenly light up with interest when a case is being discussed in the general handover and want to know more? Um, I often find myself wanting to know much more than the specifics of their chest infection treatment um, in children with medical and neurodevelopmental complexities coming through the acute pediatrics ward when I'm on call. Um, I want to learn about their baseline condition, their progress so far. I want to know their story and how this intercurrent illness fits with the bigger picture. Um, is there a need for parallel planning? Have we involved learning disability team? Um, Whilst I deal with the acute question being asked, I am keen to offer children holistic care and integrate it into the big picture, which really fits with how a community pediatrician thinks. And these um, sorts of thinking um, processes will, will apply to other subspecialties as well. I think these points that are specific and relevant to you need to feature in your application. Um, because we spend a big part of our adult lives at work, um, colleagues are like a second family, Patients and families will look after, um, make the job meaningful and interesting. And, and really ask yourself, can you see um, yourself working in the subspecialty, doing the job and enjoying it for the rest of your career? Um, as I was getting involved in more and more uh, projects in community child health, that's exactly how I felt. This was who I wanted to be. Um, now some practical points about the application. Um, Speak to current grid trainees in your subspecialty in your area. It gives you an idea of the level of experience of a successful applicant and how they evidence their skills and interests. Um, the Royal College of Specialty Training page has lots of information um, and we've listed some of them earlier. Um, look at the application documents early. I would argue look at them 12 to 18 months before you're even going to apply. Um, go through each section of the scoring sheet as Dr. Tyman has just done. Uh, think about the type of training activity you could include to score maximum points, which is your weakest area and what can you do to improve this weak area. Um, and when you write the application, I would say just let your passion and enthusiasm shine through. There are so many transferable skills in pediatrics that most things you've done can apply to your area of interest, even if not done directly linked with this area of interest. Um, have a good understanding of the subspecialty. Read the le relevant level three subspecialty curriculum for your um, area of interest, um, just to get an overview on what to expect from a career in that subspecialty and um, what particular personal attributes and skills will fit well with this career. Um, when you list your previous experience in each domain um, and describe the projects you've done, um, and, and Dr. Tamer has actually uh, touched on this, really emphasize on the impact your projects have had. Have you changed something for the better? Either is patient experience and care better because of your project? Uh, is service delivery more streamlined? Is there better training? Um, has the project changed you as a doctor and how? Um, which I think really equates to what 
excellent relevant skills are you bringing to the table and why are you a suitable and desirable person for the job? Um, make the people reading the application really want to know you and work with you and get them excited to see your future contribution to the subspecialty, I think is the general idea. Um, and I know now your focus is on the first step, on the application. Um, and uh, I know there's a separate webinar on interview skills planned later on. Um, I also wanted to give you a few very quick tips on interview preparation from my experience as well. Um, really familiarize yourself with the content and the structure of the interview. Just know what to expect. Don't be flustered on the day because you didn't expect a certain thing to happen. Um, then the next thing would be to prepare some clear structured answers to different types of common questions um, using examples from your projects and experience um, really to support the fact that you not only know the theoretical answer to the question but you have applied the concepts in practice um, leading to some positive outcome for you or others but do remember that the interview panel would not have seen your application uh, or the shortlisting score. Therefore, tell them about uh, your relevant experience and skills that link with the question being asked. Um, you'll not be prompted very much unless you veer off course a lot. So um, be prepared to have a structured answer for questions that you're being asked. Um, do as much interview preparation as you can with colleagues, supervisors, current green trainees, consultants, um, and I would say practice online to make it as close to the virtual interview as possible. Um, a lot of people find the technology aspect very frightening and I think good preparation will alleviate these fears. Make sure you have optimized your equipment, your environment and how you present yourself on the day. Um, for example, make sure you have a good enough computer, camera, microphone, Wi-Fi connection to do the job and try out your connection in the space you will use with the device you're going to use on the day. Um, Ensure you have protected time off, um, a private space that will not be invaded by children or um, pets or anyone else. Um, you have a tidy background behind you and I would say just wear comfortable smart clothes like you would in a face to face interview. Treat most of it as, as a usual face to face interview. Um, the, the software practice is very straightforward to use, to be honest. Um, and on the day, just try and relax. Um, and enjoy meeting some people working in your subspecialty. Um, engage with them, although they are um, little images on the screen, and, and share some of your passion with them. These might be people that you're looking up to, people that you've heard in conferences or um, have, have taught you something uh, in your preferred subspecialty. Um, I think your, your bigger, biggest challenge is to show the best version of yourself on the day. Um, good luck, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to take any questions you have. Thank you, Monica. Uh, so yes, so the last slide uh, on the screen there is uh, links for where you can find out more information. So if you haven't been to it already, please go to the subspecialty page on the website. The link is there. That's where all the applicant guidance is, all the downloadable forms. Uh, and information you need. Uh, we also do have a page on each subspecialty, so you can see the link there, so you can go there for more information. Um, and there should also be a link there to each CSAC's page. So each subspecialty has a, a committee, a CSAC, so you can contact them as well if you've got any questions. And uh, this is where you can find us, that email address, ntn.grid. Uh, so do contact us with any information. But I'm going to hand over to James now. He's going to introduce himself and he's going to start the Q&A. So thanks again to Monica and Kay for, for your presentations. Yes, afternoon. Hi, I'm James Clark. I'm the Head of Recruitment and Careers at the College um, uh, and this work sits within our team. Uh, I'm going to lead us through some Q&A hopefully. Um, we've already had some through uh, which I've been keeping a note of. So do, do keep adding them as we go and we'll try and get through all of them in the next sort of 10, 15 minutes. Um, so I think we'll start off. There's, a, there's been a few sort of more general ones. Um, so there's been several questions about the word count for the application form this year. Um, Eloise, do you want to take that one? Thanks, James. 
So it will be the same as last year, but because the clinical section is out of six points, we will be making that section larger. So uh, and the word count will be uh, above where you make where you write the answer. It will tell you how how many words that you need to to fit into that box. Thank you. Uh, and a couple of questions as well about sort of the general format of the interview. So um, first of all, uh, something which has been asked, uh, I think, a few years in a row now is, is whether interviewers can see the shortlisting stage answers at application. And I can I can confirm that's certainly not the case. So they don't have your application form. It, they're kind of two very separate bits this year. So shortlisting and then interview. Um, so what you say in the interview is what your interview score will be based on essentially. Um, so I don't know, Eloise or Kay, would you like to have a talk through just quickly the structure of the interview, which is one of the other questions we've had. So what, what are the sort of scoring, how the scoring domains sort of split up um, and so on and so forth? Yeah, I can take that question, James. Um, okay. So the, um, the interview length is 25 minutes. This year they will all be single panel interviews. Um, you'll have um, at least three um, assessors from the CSAC in the interview. Um, intermittently, you will have um, a independent clinical chair um, for the day or a lay chair who will listen into the interview and if that is happening you will be told and that's really just to make sure that it's a fair process um, and all the candidates are being treated equally. Um, there's four questions in the interview all of the interviews will start with a question about motivation and then they usually progress um, talking about uh, clinical reasoning, academic and then sort of team working question. Um, the, the marking um, for all questions is the same, um, but there may be waiting. So if we have tied candidates, it may be that um, we will wait certain questions if a candidate is tied on both their um, interview score um, and also their shortlisting score. James might want to add to that, but essentially shortlisting is not going to be carried forward. But if we had two candidates that were appointable at interview and they had the same interview score, we would then look to their shortlisting score to differentiate between the candidates um, and we will weight certain sections of the interview questions. So it may be decided that the clinical question, um, the, the score on that might be weighted to be the highest if there was a tie on interview questions overall. I don't think I need to add that at all. It's a perfect uh, description of it, Kay, thank you. Um, so, um, other questions? Uh, we've got a question about referees. Um, do you need to have worked with the referees clinically? Um, I suppose just to reiterate, I think we, um, Eloise mentioned referees earlier. The referees only sort of come into play if you're moving deanery, really, um, as part of a sort of pre-employment pre check. Um, and yeah, the last two should be people certainly that you've worked with clinically, but as long as they've been supervisors of yours or that have worked with you closely, that should be ample. And to be honest, it's it's not quite as strict as it is for say national recruitment. So um so experience. Would anyone like to take a question on experience? Can we use experience from other specialties? Uh Monica or okay? Um I can take that one. I think um Definitely, you can use experience from other specialties because some of the skills are um, apply across medicine, don't they? Um, patient safety, clinical skills, um, complex thinking, MDT, all of those things will apply to your to this to this subspecialty training as well. So, as long as it, you you can think about it, then it's relevant to your application and it um, it just shows why you're suited for this the subspecialty. Yes, definitely. Yeah, very much transferable skills. Um, absolutely. Um, so uh, questions on deferral, a couple of questions there, particularly with relation to sort of maternity. Um, I don't know if you can take these out of these. So first of all, if you become pregnant before a post starts, so I'm assuming that's you already a you've already accepted a post and then you become pregnant and uh, uh, need to decide what to do with your post. And then secondly, if you're already in the early stages of pregnancy while you're applying, um, do you need to declare this? Thank you. So 
On the application form, there is a box you can tick if you know that you uh, are going to defer. Now, there is only two reasons that you can defer. That's in the applicant guide. So it is for, for statutory reasons. So uh, for your ill health or if you've got or if you're on maternity leave um, or if you are, you know, going down a medical education route and have applied to do a PhD. So you put that, tick that on the application form. And if you know the date that uh, you're going to be away for, how long you're going to be away and when you'll come back, you can put that on there. If you don't know at the point of application and then you become pregnant, just make us aware as soon as possible and um, we can let the dean know that you'll be deferring. If you defer after the offers have, offers have all gone out and you've accepted, we'll just ask you to notify all the relevant people. So the deanery, the CSAC, just so we're all aware, obviously you won't be starting in September or August and, um, you know, they will be in contacted with you with your when you will be starting. Um, again, with the um, if you have applied for a PhD and you haven't found out about your funding yet, um, we do say you need to notify us within one month of the offers going out. So because the timeline has all changed this year, it's a, a month that we ask you to let us know by. Um, and if it's any later, we can't guarantee that your deferral will be accepted. That was, that's down to the deanery's concession. Um, and you can defer for up to three years. So that does cover your time doing the PhD. So uh, hopefully that's answered the question. So if you are pregnant while filling out the application form, just you know, let us know if you are definitely going to, you know, if you're going to be deferring and you know that. And if you need to defer just before, just email us and let us know. And in any of those deferrals, yeah, communication I think is just the key, you know. So even if you're, you know, you've had your PhD agreed and you're off on your three years, do do keep in, in touch with uh, certainly with the deanery you're due to go to at the end of it, but also feel free to keep in contact with us as well. Um, so a few for the application form sections. Um, so first of all, okay, would you like to take this one uh, on the audit section? Um, do you need more than one audit with national regional impact or can you have more than one but with only one having national impact? Yeah so actually that's a really good question. Um, we have had some benchmarking sessions with our assessors to make sure that we're all using the same sort of guidance but yeah my, my interpretation was that you'd have to show that you've had involvement in more than one good quality audit and at least one of those has led to either a regional or national change in practice so we wouldn't expect sort of two um, QI projects audit to result in national or regional change but at least one and that you've also done other good quality um, audits or QI projects throughout your training. Uh, I think I might ask you the next one as well, Kay, if that's all right. It's about research and the question is what exactly counts as research? Another good question, but I think really sort of research, it could be um, that you've intercalated um, and you've done a sort of a, a research project um, for that intercalation year that you've presented. Um, so it's really a research is where you've got a, a, a good question to answer and you have a research me methodology to try and answer that question. You've collated um, data and analysed those results and drawn conclusions. That is research and it can be bench-based um, quantitative research, it can be qualitative clinical research. So research has a wide definition, but we're really looking at research that can be done either at an undergraduate level. So for those of you that intercalated, you may have experience that you can draw on then or something that you've done at a postgraduate level. And that might be part of an MD or PhD, or actually it might be just that you have been involved in a, a pilot study or contributed to data collection and recruitment to research studies within the clinical unit that you're working in. So we're looking really for any any good description of research that you have personally contributed to in some fashion. Thanks, Kay. That's a really, really nice description of all. I think it's just worth worth bearing in mind that when you're writing your white space questions and all of these, 
emphasis is on kind of uh, quality over quantity on most of it, unless there are numbers stated in that in that scoring guide. Um, and we want people to basically explain things well, so it's clear that they understand what they've been doing as well as actually having that experience. So I think that's that sounds right, doesn't it, Kay? Definitely, James. Yeah, we want we do we don't want to use terminology like I helped to organise a meeting. That really doesn't mean anything. Whereas actually, you know, um, myself and one of the trainee in our region, you know, hosted a meeting for 100 trainees. Um, we organised X, Y, and Z. We, we want that sort of level of information in the answers. Um, saying that you helped or you contributed to, but without really stating your role, you're not going to get awarded marks for that. Absolutely, uh, thank you. Um, and on the learnings, uh, sorry, on the leadership section, I think it's almost been answered already in that last one, but uh, what if your experience is undergraduate? Um, as far as I'm aware, that's perfectly OK. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, OK, so another question here. So what are the learning skills questions about? I'm assuming that's relating to the team working and learning skills questions in the interview. Um, so uh, sorry, uh, Kay or Monica again, I think possibly. Um, yeah, we could we could both talk about that. Yeah, so in the um, so I think are you I'll just have a quick look back. So I'm assuming are you talking about clinical reasoning or is this in the I think it's the, it's uh, team, the, uh, team working. working and learning skills because I think they're combined in the title of that section, aren't they? Yeah, so I think it's um so you'll often get a sort of um a sort of scenario so um maybe that the question might be around a sort of a, a clinical case where there's a difference of opinion within the team um or it may be that actually it's a sort of an ethical dilemma where there may be disagreement or difficult decision to be made in conjunction with the um with the family of, of, of the child involved so it's really exploring how you what is your approach to team working how you understand you know stand the function of the mdt to work um and, and it really what you know what you've learned from your past experience um and how would you deal um, with this situation as a trainee thank you um we're nearing the end of the questions and we're, we're nearing the end of the session as well but i think we've got time for one more thing which is always important to talk about less than full-time training um i don't know who'd like to say that the, the question that's been asked is can you go less than full-time after starting a post at full-time i don't know eloise do you want to give us a bit of a rundown on the whole less than full-time situation yeah, so all trainees are able to apply to less than full time training. So all the posts that will be advertised are uh, full time or less than full time. So uh, to be less than full time, you can, there's a, again a tick box on the form, but you can also change during your training and you just um, apply through the deanery. So they will have all the paperwork for that. So you just need to speak to your deanery about working less than full time. So that's it's available to all trainees now. Absolutely. Um, I uh, there's a quite a specific uh, question here. So I haven't intercalated. I don't have a master's or PhD, but I have been involved in reviewing and analysing data that has been presented. Would this count or would this overlap too much with the posters presentation section? I think that may be one for Kay again, potentially just to finish off what we were just talking about. Yeah, so if you can um, describe um, what the study was that you were involved in and what your role is, you might be able to um, gain some marks in the research section. So it's very much, I think, what you're describing, I'm interpreting as being that you may have contributed to have been gathering sort of data um, as part of a clinical study. So you need to describe that clinical study and what your role was in data collection and, and, and what you learned from that process. Thank you. Um, there's also just a couple of questions about um, anonymising for the sort of publications section and so on uh, and what that actually means essentially. If somebody's, if somebody's asked actually how do you do it while staying anonymous, are you happy if we do put our names on there? 
Yeah, so I, I could probably answer this one, James. In the past, if you put your name down, you get a maximum of one mark, even if you had multiple peer reviewed multi, um, publications um, and presentations at national meetings. But now we're not negatively marking, so we're not like removing marks if you have put your name there. But my, my general you know, advice is to actually remove your name from the publication list. You know, that is good practice. Um, you shouldn't be seen to really be currying favour by making yourself known in your application. It's not really doing you any favours. Yeah, absolutely. And we, and we do want to try and keep that part of it as anonymous as possible. Um, so I think we're nearly there with the questions. I've got one question about, so regarding across HE deaneries, does London count as one deanery? or do NCEL and so on uh, count as different for scoring, etc. Um, so where the, the description of the phrase across HE deaneries, this is out of the glossary. So uh, that's that's essentially saying that um, it's across one deanery as opposed to across all of them. So if you're part of HEE, um, it's it means that the uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Eloise, I think this is uh, for the sort of publications and so on. Uh, um, sorry, research and uh, and so on. So um, if it's had an impact across HE deaneries, we don't expect it to have been HE wide, i.e. all of the English deaneries. It's just across any of the HE deaneries or across Wales or across uh, uh, Northern Ireland or across Scotland. So uh, I hope that, that verifies that bit in the glossary. Yeah, so that um, would be for regional, <clears throat> that, like each HE deanery would count as a something regional uh, rather than local or national so uh, yeah so hopefully we've explained that right so it would be like uh, you know if you've made a change or had a publication in West Midlands rather than like just a local deanery so um, yeah so that's all the questions we've received so far so I think we'll, we'll start winding up there I have saved the most important question till last though somebody has asked why is it called grid wouldn't we all love to know uh it's uh yeah it's one of those that's been around for who knows how long well certainly since 2006 when it first started probably uh, back when spreadsheets were some great mystery of a of a grid and they were all listed on there so but uh don't be surprised if the word grid starts sort of slowly fading into into the background over the next few years um I think we'll 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 wrap it up there. Unless there's any sort of last comments that Monica would like to make, or or Kay even, or Eloise. Um, I would just encourage everyone to apply. Just just go for it. You have nothing to lose, um, and and you learn lots about yourself and your interests by applying um, alone. Yeah, and good luck. And I would. Yeah, I would just like to echo what Monica said, you know, don't be deterred by thinking this is a too competitive process. It's really about, you know, finding what you're passionate about and, you know, the subspeciality that, you know, is the right fit for you and you're the right fit for that subspeciality and really just putting everything into your um, your shortlisting application um, and getting through to interview and use the interview as an opportunity to shine. So it can be a scary sort of process and interview, but really try not to be scared by it, try to embrace it. Everybody in the interview panel is willing you to do well. So really, you know, do as proud and do as well as you can. Uh, good advice, Kay and Monica, certainly. So uh, thank you ever so much to everybody that's attended this afternoon. Just to confirm, I think what Eloise mentioned at the beginning, that we will be pulling together any all the questions and doing a little FAQ document that we'll put on the website as soon as we can get it together. Uh, and we will also have this recording available on our YouTube channel as well. So if you want to watch it back or if you want to let any of your colleagues know that it's going to be available, then please do. Um, I'm sure we'll make uh, reference to it on the web pages and probably by, uh, via sort of our Twitter as well. So. Uh, Thanks everybody and good luck everyone that takes part in this year's process. Goodbye. Thank you. Good luck. Bye.